Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is D, and welcome to episode 86 of the Benzo Free Podcast. Well, I'm back in the studio. It's kind of nice to be here. Actually, it's really nice to be here speaking with you all again. Last episode we did was on Benzo Trivia. I kind of had fun with that one. I hope you did too. And Before that, of course, we've done a lot of road, <laughs> a lot of road podcasts. So the situation with my folks is still progressing. The good news is we did finally close on selling their house this week, which is one big piece of the puzzle. There's still several others to work out, but that should help some. I just got back from the mountains. I was up in Vail, Colorado. Vail is one of my favorite places. In fact, I was on the, um, I was on the Vail Film Festival's advisory board for 10 years and ran their educational programming for some time and used to spend a lot of time up there. What a beautiful, what a beautiful town. I was up there for my friend's wedding, uh, JB. I know I've mentioned him a few times on this show. I just want to shout out real quick and let JB and Melissa know congratulations on your wedding. I really, I'm really happy for the two of you and hope for the best in your future. But I just also want to say thank you to JB. Um, he has been a true, true friend, and I just want to let him know how much I appreciate him. Not only is he my best friend and was the best man at my wedding some 25 years ago, but he's, um, he's also listened to just about every podcast episode I've put out. He's the only friend that's done that. And it's amazing to, it's, it's surprising to realize how important that is, how nice that is that somebody goes out of their way to pay attention to what's important to you. I think we all, we all value that in a friend, somebody who not only is there to do the things that you enjoy doing together, but also goes out of their way to pay attention to the things that also matter to you most. So thank you, JB. I'm, I am so grateful that you're in my life. I also want to just say a, a really heartfelt thank you also to, to Pam and Lee. You know who you are. And um, they have been perhaps the biggest supporters of this podcast. And I'm just so grateful for what they've done and, um, and, and to be there when, it, when we had, we, when we had to, um, say goodbye to Bear, my dog. Um, Pam and Lee were really there for me, and I, I really appreciate that. They went out of their way um, to let me know how how important it was and how much they felt for, for what we went through and just to be good friends. So again, I just got to say, I think what I'm trying to say there at this beginning is we talk so much about benzodiazepine withdrawal and a support system and how key that is for what so many of us are going through. I am blessed. I am more than blessed. I have one of the best friends out there. I mean, in addition to my wife, who is my closest friend, but JB and his wife and to Pam and Lee and to so many people out there. Um, I could just start naming off names and would do it, but I would leave somebody out and I, I hate to do that. But Many of you have been with me for six months, a year, two years on this podcast or longer, and we've gotten to know each other. Um, and I just, I just want to say thank you to, to all those people to, I think what I'm just trying to say, um, is how much that support system means to us and how important it is to have friends. So how am I doing? Um, pretty good. Pretty good. I, um, getting away for the wedding was really nice. In fact, there was one moment on there where 
Yes, I had a margarita or two. I occasionally partake of alcohol. I don't do it often. But and having a dinner with my friends um, before the wedding where I really let loose. And with all the stuff that's been going on this year with my family and my folks, I think I didn't understand how much that was always on my mind and that I was never free of it, never escaped it. And that dinner and just having fun with my friends and, and my wife, Shanna, and and at, at a restaurant in Vail was just, was really special. And it, it, it was one of those first windows where I don't think I was worrying about anything else. And those are magical. And that was really nice. So I'm kind of <laughs> working off that a little bit and keeping some of that, those juices going as much as I can. But Shannon and I got back home. Uh, I'm back trying to catch up on things. Posted a couple archive podcasts the other day. And now recording this new one for you all. So just trying to get back into the groove. Anyway, um, I wanted to say that. I wanted to talk about um, all my ums <laughs> as we go again. I'm going to really try to reduce that this time. I'll keep working on, on my skills as a broadcaster and try to re reduce some of my ums and pauses and, and flubs. But they're still going to be there because they are who I am. And I'm going to still leave them in because it's, it's what's going on. Today we're going to do mailbags. So, um, see, there's another um. I told you they'd come back. <laughs> but today we are going to talk about mailbags. So I kind of want to get to that because that's really what the core of today's episode is. Thanks again for your emails, for all your contact. Please keep it coming. You all have been great. Benzo stories, I will get back to those again soon. I promise and share those now and then. But since we've been doing a little shorter episodes, I've been kind of focusing on one topic on each different episode. Today, of course, will be our mailbag. In fact, we have another good episode, great episode, I'm hoping coming out, I'm sure it will be <laughs> next week, which will be, I'm hoping this will be released next week, but this coming Tuesday, I have the pleasure to speak with Dr. Colin Bradley. Um, I'll be interviewing him for the podcast, and then I will edit that down, and hopefully within the week following, I will have that released. Dr. Colin Bradley is um, leads the Department of General Practice at University College Cork in Southern Ireland, and he was awarded a Fulbright Scholarship in 2017 to study the opioid crisis in the U.S. Around 2000, he was appointed to a group set up to advise the Irish government on benzodiazepines. And he is now working with a group of academics and people who experienced issues with benzo use and withdrawal to help better manage benzodiazepine-related issues in primary care. Whew, that's needed. In fact, <laughs> it was this group where I first met Dr. Bradley. I was also pulled into this team and I met with him and he was gracious enough to take the time and be willing to talk with us on the podcast. So please stay tuned for that. That's coming up. That should be our next podcast. And I'm really excited to get back to doing, to having some guests on this podcast again. Anyway, that's all coming up. So I'm not going to ramble too much on in the introduction. I probably already did. But instead, I am going to jump in to talk about our format. Our format today will include our introduction, which you just heard, our mailbag, which is our feature, your questions, your comments, your concerns. I, I love it when I can share your voice on this podcast. And we will close out with our moment of peace. It should be a really good episode, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. I'm always hoping it's a good episode. I wouldn't I wouldn't record one of these if I didn't hope it would be a good episode, but some do stand out better than others, I will admit. I hope so. Anyway, before we move on, don't forget, I would love to hear from you. Comment on our videos on YouTube, on our podcast posts, or on our feedback forum on our website at easinganxiety.com slash feedback. And while you're there, perhaps you might want to subscribe to the mailing list or even donate to support the work we do, trust me. Every little bit of that helps. And remember, the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. Okay, I guess that wraps up our intro. Let's move on to our feature, which is our mailbag. You know, I think these are my favorite type of episodes. I, I mean, having the guests on are pretty awesome, and that's why I'm looking forward to the one with Colin Bradley. But I also, I think even more so, I enjoy sharing what you have written to me. And 
So I, I love doing that. I love sharing your emails and your comments and your feedback form um, submissions. I just love sharing those things because that's that's our conversation, and that's what excites me the most about this podcast. And, and as I've done lately with the mailbag episodes, I'm going to respond to most of these without a lot of prep. I, I used to write out all my answers to all the mailbag questions when I'd share them, but I've tried to get, again, more, more raw and more natural in my responses. I think it flows a little better, and I've gotten good feedback that, that you all kind of feel that that's, that's the direction we should go. But I did write up a few um, answers on these, at least some quotes, because sometimes the answer requires a little bit of research on my part. And so I will look up a quote or two, or I'll, I'll, I'll put in some bullets in my script of what I think might be appropriate to respond. So without any further delay, <laughs> let's take a look inside the mailbag. I, I, I feel like I need some special effect here on my voice uh, to make it sound like I'm heading deep into the burlap bag. But... I'm really not that creative. That was me cupping my hands over my mouth, and it probably sounded nothing like somebody diving into a big burlap mailbag. <laughs> but that's the low-key special effects on the Benzo Free podcast. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> oh, our first comment is from Oliver. When I released our trivia episode last week, I... I asked for anyone who sees an error with my answers to please let me know. And Oliver was kind enough to do just that. The, the question was in regard to the drug flumazenil, which is used by some people to help reduce symptoms in benzo withdrawal. I stated that flumazenil was an agonist, meaning it binds with the GABA receptors and activates those receptors. I was wrong. <laughs> Here's what Oliver said in his comment. Hi, D. Another great episode. In regards to flumazenil, you said it was an agonist. My understanding is it's an antagonist, partial agonist. Thanks again. These episodes have helped me through the hard times. I've been off Valium and Xanax for nine months after taking them for 24 years. Thanks to flumazenil, subcutaneous infusion over 16 days. Well, first off, congratulations, Oliver. That is great news. I am so glad that flumazenil helped you. I've, I've been doing more research on this and will dedicate a whole episode to it soon. I just want to try to get all the pieces together before we cover that. But regarding the correction, I took Oliver's comments seriously and did a little bit of research on my own just to make sure everything was in place. And here is what I wrote back to him. I think that might be the best way to present my answer here. So this is what I wrote back to him. Hi, Oliver. Thanks for the message. It's so nice to hear people listening and willing to send in corrections. And I stand corrected. Thank you. I'm sure you know this, but for the others, let me give it a stab and, and let me know how I do. Agonists bind to specific receptors and activate those receptors. Benzodiazepines are a perfect example of this. They are GABA receptor agonists often called BZRAs, in the medical community because of this. And they activate GABA receptors causing an, hip, an inhibitory, always hard to say that, an inhibitory effect, calming our system. Antagonists bind to the same receptors, but don't activate them. And they often block them from other chemicals binding, like benzos. Flumazenil is a benzodiazepine antagonist. It binds to the GABA receptors, preventing benzos from doing the same, and thus preventing their inhibitory effect. Thus, flumazenil is often used to help reverse effects of benzodiazepines. And flumazenil is also a weak partial agonist in some animals but hasn't been shown to be significantly so in humans. Well, that was the research I did, and that was what I wrote back to Oliver. So, so basically, I just needed to correct that we do not use flumazenil as an agonist, but instead as an antagonist, meaning that it helps to block the receptors from receiving the benzo signals, and thus actually reducing their inhibitory effect. Thanks, Oliver. 
I must say this. The day I stop listening to you all, my friends and listeners on the podcast, is the day I stop doing the podcast. As you well know, and I'll say this again in the next question, but I am not a medical professional, and thus everything that I understand or think I understand about benzos is from a layperson's point of view. I love to learn, and part of that is being corrected when I'm wrong. Thank you, Oliver. I stand corrected, and I appreciate you letting me know. Let's move on to our next question, which is from Ralph in Aurora, Illinois. I know Aurora, Illinois. I used to, I grew up, my grade school, eh, I can keep rambling here. <laughs> I spent nine years living outside of Chicago, Illinois, in a town called St. Charles back when I was pretty young. That was my grade school days primarily. And um, Aurora was very close by. In fact, I played hockey in Aurora, Illinois. So anyway, <laughs> not that you needed to know that, but I thought I'd just interject a little personal note there. Here's what Ralph says. Would it be in keeping with Benzodiazepine Information Coalition guidelines or from your experience of five to 10% withdrawal every four weeks or less? I am stuck out here on a doctor's prescription of two milligrams on clonazepam, used nightly for sleep. As you know, there are no manufactured doses to address my need. Could I reduce 0 0.001 milligram a day for 340 days to get off the benzos? Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. I really appreciate the, the question. And it's a good one. First off, just like I mentioned before, I cannot advise anyone on tapering. I am not a medical professional, and advising you on how to taper is actually considered medical advice, and I cannot provide medical advice. But there is some information out there, so let's take a look a little bit of it. He mentioned Benzodiazepine Information Coalition's information. That's kind of redundant, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, BIC is the acronym used for this organization. and There can be found at benzoinfo.com. And what he's referring to, I believe, is a page on their website titled Benzodiazepine Tapering Strategies and Solutions. And if you scroll down under Recommended Taper Rate, this page states, The general guideline is to not exceed a 5 to 10% reduction of the current dose every four weeks. One study found that tapering method used by many physicians to reduce a benzodiazepine dose by 25% a week was ineffective for at least 32 to 42%. That is, those people failed to get off the drug. Now, that's what Bick actually states on their website, and I think that's what he's referring to. Now, there are differing opinions online. Benzo Buddies, which, is, which can be found at benzobuddies.org, on their benzodiazepine withdrawal support page under direct taper suggest. We suggest that unless past experience of attempted tapering indicates otherwise, members should initially try cutting their dose by no more than about 10%. And will probably make new cuts, about 10% of their dose at the time of the new cut, every seven to 14 days. These figures are intended as ballpark estimates mileage will vary. So that's what's on Benzo Buddies. And on my website, I actually even, I don't really refer to it at all, to be honest. In fact, I purposely don't state tapering advice on my website because I don't believe I should give medical advice. And not that these other, or other organizations are. They are basically just sharing information that they have discovered or that other experts have stated, such as Ashton and others. In my podcast, and actually in my book, I do talk about what I called the 10-2 rule, which was based off of the Benzo Buddy suggestion, basically saying 10% every two weeks. But keep in mind, that is a maximum usually, not a minimum. Many people go slower and have to go so much slower. So let me mention five keys really quick here that I believe are important when we decide how to taper. Now, again, these are not advice. This is just things that I have learned along the way and that I would consider if I was doing this again. Number one, don't stop cold turkey. Professor Ashton said in her manual, abrupt cessation of benzodiazepines may be very dangerous. And she's right. Stopping cold turkey can cause seizures and even death in some people. 
and can make any future attempt at withdrawal more difficult. Number two, have a strong support system. I mentioned that earlier, but having people to support you, physician, medical professionals, therapists, friends, family, just having people around you is essential to tapering. Three, go at your own pace. Flexibility is key in tapering. There's no real hurry to do this. Coming off this at your own pace is key. Most people, including Ashton and others, have found success is more likely in people who have had control over the pace of their withdrawal. If you get too many symptoms, there's no reason you can't stop for a while and pause until those symptoms somewhat subside before you do another cut. Number four, work with your doctor. I always mention this on our podcast because I do believe it's important. I also mention it in my book. I feel that doctors are key, even those who may not be as educated on benzos as you may wish them to be. And even if it's hard to find the doctor to work with, you need a doctor not only to prescribe the reductions in dosage or to substitute for a different medication if that's what you choose, but also to help you out with all the symptoms and to run tests and to try to ease your mind as you go through this process. And number five, be kind. Be kind to those around you and even more so to yourself. If you screw up on your taper, so you screwed up. It's okay. If you updosed, if you reinstated, if you drank to alcohol, if you, you know, took caffeine and it upset you or you did this or whatever, you're going to make mistakes. The worst thing you can do is to constantly berate or blame yourself for those. Let yourself off the hook. This is hard. You are going to make mistakes. And that also goes to the pace of your withdrawal. This is not a contest. This is not a first one across the finish line wins. Crossing the finish line is what's important. Your health is what's important. Take your time. Anyway, I just want to thank um, Ralph for the question. I thought it was great, and I just wanted to give a little feedback on it. Let's move on to our third, our third question, and this one is from Nick. Nick writes, I am currently struggling with benzodiazepine dependence, mainly diazepam and clonazepam, or clonopin. I have other addictions such as methadone and crack cocaine. I am going to detox shortly. I've been doing the groundwork such as everything I have is to get into detox and rehab as it costs a lot in the UK. So you have to show you are serious and rightly so. Anyways, to be honest, I am really scared and can't talk to anyone who knows about it properly. The drug centers are great, but don't know much when it comes to benzos. And I know that nothing else will work if I don't stop the benzos. Don't know what else to say. I'm struggling. Anyways, appreciate the channel. Well, thanks, Nick. Um, ah, man, I, I, I wish I could help you. I wish I, I wish I could do more. I, I feel for you. I know how hard this is. First off, I, I, I share stories like this. Sometimes, while most of us who deal with benzodiazepine and their complications are dealing with dependence, and many of us, most of us have taken them as prescribed, but not all of us. Some of us have had addiction problems with other medications or with other drugs, much like Nick here. And that also complicates it. We make absolutely no judgment as to who you are or your life choices. We're trying to help everybody. Okay, so whether it's dependence alone in an iotrogenic instance where you've taken it only prescribed or you've had problems with drugs and addiction throughout and you're trying to come clean or, or not, or just trying to survive this and find a better way of living, we want to help you. So anyway, polydrugging is complicated, whether it's prescribed drugs or street drugs, it complicates everything because you don't know which drug do I come off of. Which one should I come off of first? Should I? Which one's causing the most problems? If I'm coming off of a drug or two, it, are, are these symptoms because of that one or something else? It just complicates things. And it leaves a lot of questions. I wish I had answers here. I really did. Um, detox, rehab facilities, 
we are currently working actually through the benzodiazepine action work group in reaching out to detox facilities and trying to get some communication there. Um, I have a couple meetings coming up on that, actually trying to not only learn from them because they have had some experience, but also just to start a conversation to try to improve how rehab facilities handle benzodiazepine patients. So we're, we're working on that. We hopefully can start some pilot programs and get those out there to rehab facilities and so we can start working together on this. And also, Nick, I understand being scared. Um, this is frightening for all of us. And you know what? I'm going to talk about that in the last question we covered today. So I'm going to stop there on that one, but we'll talk more about that. Thanks, Nick. Our next question is from Loretta, and it is quite succinct. Her question was in response to our video on the FDA warning last fall for benzodiazepines. She wrote, but when can people sue? Well, thank you, Loretta. Nice and simple. <laughs> Litigation, as I've said before on this podcast, the decision whether to sue over what has happened to you is completely a personal decision. But it is difficult. Uh, many people will tell you you have to have perfect, clean records. It needs to be a situation where there's not a lot of extenuating circumstances affecting what you've been through. Lawyers are going to be you know, are going to be there trying to break down your story. Lawyers from the pharmaceuticals, lawyers from the doctors, whoever you're trying to sue, are going to find some, look for flaws in your story or problems in your story. This is just the situation within the legal community. So you need to make sure that your story is pretty solid with little extenuating circumstances or other conflicts or problems. And the truth is, few studies actually really back our claims. We still need so much more research, so that's going to also help um, stem the tide. Now, some have sued with mixed success. I, in fact, I wrote a whole chapter on benzos and the law in my book in Benzo Free. Yes, I have to sneak in a personal plug now and then. But there have been lawsuits. Uh, a class action lawsuit against drug manufacturers was filed in the United Kingdom in the late 1980s involving 14,000 patients and 1,800 law firms. It, it alleged that the manufacturers knew of the dependent's potential, but, but intentionally withheld this information from doctors. This was the largest ever class action lawsuit against a drug manufacturer at the time in UK history. Now, the court case never reached a verdict. There were allegations that consulting psychiatrists had conflicts of interest and legal aid was withdrawn. In the end, the litigation led to changes in British law which actually made class action lawsuits like this more difficult to prove. So that didn't end too well. But, you know, it's not all bad news. Between 2010 and 2016, the Medical Defense Union in the UK paid out almost £750,000 in compensation and legal costs on behalf of members involved in 11 cases. Ray Nimmo, the founder of Benzo.org.uk website, which houses the Ashton Manual, received £40,000 in an out-of-court settlement in 2002 after being prescribed Valium as a muscle relaxant for stomach pain in 1984. And Luke Montague, the Viscount Hitchingbrook, suffered from benzodependence for years after being prescribed them for a sinus infection. For 19 years, he was prescribed a combination of drugs, including clonazepam or clonopin. He received 1.35 million pounds for his suffering. Now, that's just a small sampling of litigation efforts in, regarding benzodiazepines, and I'm sure if you did some research, you could find many more. If you'd like to learn more about these, I actually have listed these in the references section of our show notes. But back to litigation. It's a really good question, and I think it's a personal one. You need to decide whether the route that you wish to take is to sue or not to sue. For some of you, you are in such a financial strain that suing is the only option to be able to keep going and to pay your medical bills and to cover your out-of-work expenses or other expenses that have come from this, and I completely understand that. But please also know that suing pharmaceutical companies or doctors is a long, drawn-out, and emotionally distressing event. And sometimes 
it can actually cause more damage than it's worth. Make sure you know what you're getting into. Don't let anybody push you into it. But if you decide to take this on, I wish you good luck. Let's move on. Our next question is from Kathy. Kathy writes, It has been a while since I last communicated with you. I am following the Ashton Manual and now down to 7 milligram liquid volume, and my titration is slowing down. I am still going through severe withdrawals such as anxiety and constant shaking. I still have a tough road ahead of me, even off the volume completely. I know that my body will still have to heal. I have a question for you that I cannot get a clear answer from doctors. Have you ever heard from anyone while in benzo withdrawals having trouble with exercise? Every time I do any kind of exercise, I am left with uncontrollable shakiness and muscle spasms. Anything that you have heard will be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Kathy. Well, thanks, Kathy. I really appreciate the question and for sharing it with us on the podcast here. That's, that's a great question. Two things here. For, first off, yes, muscle complications are very common in benzo withdrawal. In fact, it's one of the six categories of physical symptoms. So definitely it's got its own category. So it's pretty significant and shakiness, tremors, along with stiffness and pulls and tears and ran random movements um, and random pains are all related to this. And, and there's two things going on here. First off is nerve damage. Nerves communicate with our muscles. They tell them when to move and when not to move. And they also send messages back from our muscles including messages of pain to our brain. So it makes sense that if this communication network, that is our central nervous system, is damaged, then these communication signals may not be communicated properly. Second is muscle rigidity. Most benzos are strong muscle relaxants, and when removed, those muscles can, those muscles can lock up after years of taking a muscle relaxant. And that also causes problems, can also lead to muscle strains, pulls, tears, damage. I had experience with this. I, PT is also a very helpful thing, but it's also very difficult. I was in physical therapy during my withdrawal and trying to get some help for some of my muscles, but even physical therapists were pushing my muscles too fast, too far. If you're having trouble with shakiness or muscle spasms or any other muscle-related types of issues, you need to listen to your body and adjust your exercise for that. If that is bothering you, if those symptoms are causing more problems, then maybe adjust your exercise so that you can get exercise during this time but not push yourself too far. Honestly, the best advice I can give, and again, I don't give advice. <laughs> this is not advice. <laughs> but if it was me... And that is to listen to your body. I, if I went through this again, I would make sure I listen to my body. If it feels like I'm pushing it too far, then back off. Injuring yourself does not help anyone, and it just makes your recovery even harder. Listen to your body. Take your time. Do exercise you can do without causing any damage or any serious symptoms. I know that doesn't help a lot, but maybe that gives a little bit of background or a little bit of information to help you. Let's move on to our last one here. As I'm getting tongue-tied and having trouble thinking of words to say, so I will slow down a bit. Our last comment is from Jennifer. She wrote this simple statement on our YouTube channel, and I think it sums things up that I wanted to share it here. Jennifer writes, So glad I found you. I am so scared. That's it. That's what she wrote. This ties back to our question from Nick, who was going through detox, you heard just a little bit ago too, who also talked about his fear. And I want to say to both of them, to Jennifer and Nick and everyone else out there, I know. I know, I get it, and wow, okay. <laughs> oh, jeez, I got a tear. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm just, I just, my emotions are a part of this, but... God, when I talk to you all on such an emotional level about what you're going through, the tears start to flow. And 
I am not ashamed to let them flow and leave them on this show because I know that's what connects with you guys. I know it's what connects with you all. My God, I, I think I haven't cried in a while, so this is good that this is coming out here, isn't it? Hang on. Yes, that is the sound effect, if you heard it or not, of Kleenex. Hang on a minute. Let me wipe my eyes. And now I do what I always do, which is cover with um, making fun of myself. <laughs> but um, communicating with you all about what you're going through does touch my, my heart, and it comes out. Fear is perhaps the most universal of all symptoms of benzene withdrawal. And it's, it's so many things. This is such a hard thing to go through, even if our emotional state was acting normally, which it's not in benzene withdrawal. We're dealing with irrational fears where our nerves are damaged. We're not responding. We can't calm ourselves, so we get caught in these loops. So it's, it's enhanced by the damage to our nervous system. But even if it wasn't, just seeing what benzo withdrawal looks like would scare the hell out of most people anyway. And again, please, 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 no, I am not trying to scare anybody here, okay? In fact, I'm trying to do the opposite. Only a small percentage of people really deal with severe complications of benzo withdrawal. And even those can often be mitigated or managed via a slow taper with doctor supervision and with a good support system. So please, please don't think this is some kind, another kind of horror story I'm talking about. But what I'm trying to talk to here are those people who are in the middle of it and are having a lot of problems and who are really afraid. I get that. I get that. Okay? And I just want you to know that. Ashton wrote the following in her manual, and I think this is one of my favorites, but it's one to keep in mind. She said, many withdrawal symptoms are simply due to fear of withdrawal or even fear of that fear. I, I love that one. That is so insightful from Ashton, as, <laughs> as is almost everything she writes in her manual. Again, I didn't mention this previously, so I just want to say I'm talking about the Ashton Manual. If you haven't heard of it, go check it out. You can learn more on our website at benzofree.org slash Ashton. And from there is a link to the Ashton Manual. So if you don't know about it, go check it out, please. But like she said, is that the fear, which is a symptom of benzo withdrawal, also creates more symptoms. And increases their severity. In fact, she said the following also in, the, in her manual. She said, above all, stop worrying. Worry, fear, and anxiety increase all withdrawal symptoms. Many of these symptoms are actually due to anxiety and not signs of brain or nervous system damage. People who fear withdrawal have more intense symptoms than those who just take it as it comes. And, and think positively and confidently about recovery. Oh, those are good instructions and good luck in trying to stay true to them. It's exactly what we should be doing. But to tell somebody to stop worrying and stop being fearful, well, we also know it's never that simple. It's never that simple, but it is something to work on. That's why I spend so much time on the podcast and in my book and in other places talking about managing your anxiety and managing your fear. If you can develop tools during this time to help manage your anxiety, which thus reduces your fear, it in turn reduces all of your symptoms. It takes work though. This isn't easy. It will take work. So I just wanted to say I get, I get it. I get the fear. I had a lot of it in withdrawal, and it was pervasive. It affected everything, and the fear fed the fear, just as Ashton mentions. But I did eventually find a place of acceptance. I found a way to stop fighting it. I, wound, I found a way to be okay with what's going on. My symptoms eased a bit. I found some positive things in life. And I found a way to get through it. And you will too.
you will too. Okay, let's close out that. Let's let's stop that. Let's move on. <laughs> oh, that's all we have time for today. Um, we covered a lot. We got six comments and questions in, and I love doing that. We'll do that again soon because I think those these podcasts are great. I love these episodes. And, and I have more to share, but I would still love to hear more from you. Please comment on our posts on our YouTube channel or on our feedback form at easinganxiety.com slash feedback. I would love to hear from you. These are the messages. This is the feedback. This is the communication. This, these are the relationships that feed this podcast. So thank you so much to everyone for all you've done to support me and the podcast and each other over the years. And now, before we relax with our moment of peace, which is coming up very soon, please allow me just 25 seconds for our disclaimer. Thanks. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal or professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benson Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. Try to focus on something that appeals to you. The slow, rhythmic inhale and exhale of your breath. A favorite mantra, prayer, or saying. The sounds of soothing music in the background. Or anything else that calms you. Whatever your object of focus, pay attention to it without judgment or labeling. Just experience it. And please remember that you should only do this if you are in a safe place where you can close your eyes, relax, and let the world pass by without you for a minute. Let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly along with all the stress of the day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and naturally. and listen to some soft music in the background as you relax your entire body and find the peace within. If your mind wanders, just gently bring it back to your object of focus. Continue to do this for one minute.
next scheduled episode is episode 87. Thank you again for joining me today, and please, let us know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.